The name of Billy Graham is probably the most recognizable name in the world of Christendom since around 1950. Most would credit him with being the greatest evangelist in Christian history. We would not agree with that assessment. We would say that Billy Graham is the most deceptive preacher in Christian history. And if you will listen to this study of his ministry in its entirety, you will be challenged to agree with us or you'll be faced with denying the facts as they stand. As we produce this expose of his life, Billy Graham is near the end of his life. This might lead some to wonder why we would bother to spend time on Graham. After all, he is no longer active in ministry. But the fact is, when Billy passes on, there will be a world blitz of his message. Documentaries and tributes will appear in all quarters. Entire magazine issues will be dedicated to his memory. His books, CDs, videos, and other works will sell into the hundreds of millions. He'll have hundreds of millions of hits on his website. And what message will these people hear? If the effect of Graham's message on the world during his life was to help strengthen Rome and build the world church, what will this wave of materials after his death have on a new generation that is already being swept up into the Alexandrian Bibles and apostate emergent church movement. Give your life to Christ tonight. Let him give you a new heart. Make you a new person. And give you the joy and the peace that you've always longed for. Now, it'll cost you something. It doesn't come cheap. It costs Christ his blood. It costs God his son. And it'll cost you your sins. He demands that you deny self, take up the cross, take his unpopularity, take your place with him in suffering if need be, but in return he'll give you a new heart, he'll accept you into his kingdom, he'll forgive the past, he'll make you a new creation. That was Billy preaching in 1957. His message appeared strong, but he was already selling out to the spirit of Antichrist and the ecumenical movement. Stay with us, and you're going to be shocked at the deception that took place beginning as early as 1950. Billy Graham was saved in a revival meeting in 1934 under the preaching of a great fundamentalist preacher named Mordecai Ham. He went to Bob Jones College, but found the rules too rigid, so he transferred to Florida Bible Institute. Graham's own reflection on this move on page 46 of his autobiography titled, Just As I Am, is very telling. He says, quote, One thing that thrilled me was the diversity of viewpoints we were exposed to in the classroom a wondrous blend of ecumenical and evangelical thought that was really ahead of its time, end quote. Key word there, ecumenical. This would explain why Graham would still be struggling over the issue of the infallibility of Scripture right up to the time of the L.A. Crusade that would catapult Graham into worldwide fame. Again, on page 136 of his autobiography, Graham said, quote, the particular problem I was wrestling with for the first time since my conversion as a teenager was the inspiration and authority of the scriptures. End quote. The Florida Bible Institute is an Alexandrian institution that corrected the King James Bible and planted the seeds of apostasy in so doing. The Florida Bible Institute represents the typical evangelical and fundamentalist Bible school today. It left Graham without faith in his Bible and left him completely void of any appreciation for the necessity of rejecting heresy and apostasy. He then said on page 139 of his autobiography, quote, With the Los Angeles campaign galloping toward me, I had to have an answer. If I could not trust the Bible, I could not go on. I would have to quit the school presidency. I would have to leave pulpit evangelism, end quote. He then described a walk he took in the woods, where he laid his Bible on a stump, and he prayed. His account of this prayer was to say, Father, I am going to accept this as thy word by faith. I am going to allow faith to go beyond my intellectual questions and doubts, and I will believe this to be your inspired word. Billy was holding a King James Bible in his hands. That would change. 
Billy obviously had questions, and those questions were obviously the result of the reuse of the Alexandrian critical theory and text, and it appears that instead of getting solid answers, he began to hobnob with liberals and neo-evangelicals like Carl F. H. Henry. Here is Graham introducing Henry at the Berlin World Congress on Evangelization in 1966. Dr. Carl Henry is going to come and bring an address to us at this time, and I think we ought to say a word of appreciation. Thank you very much for those gracious and undeserved words, Dr. Graham. In a booklet titled Evangelism and the Church Today, Billy Graham gave to workers at his crusades. He writes, quote, The great theologians of today are Rudolf Boltmann, Karl Barth, Emil Brunner, Reinhold Niebuhr, Paul Tillich, and Carl Henry, end quote. Only Henry out of that whole bunch, believed the Bible at all. Boltmann, Barth, Bruner, Niebuhr, and Tillich were complete apostates. Billy Graham was virtually unknown to most of the world until he came to the city of Los Angeles in 1949. While in Los Angeles, for reasons that no one has really uncovered, William Randolph Hearst ordered his publications to, quote, Puff Graham. They did. He was front page news, and that headline was repeated the world over. He was all the talk on radio, TV, and in movie theaters across the country. The following is the audio from a newsreel that played all over America in theaters while the L.A. Crusades were going on. You can imagine the excitement of Christians who saw the signs of a possible national revival on the horizon. The city of Los Angeles, California has grown to such proportions that it covers many square miles between the Sierra Madre Mountains and the Pacific Ocean. In this area, Four million men, women, and children live going to and fro, seeking, reaching, waiting. From Minneapolis comes the young evangelist Billy Graham and song leader Cliff Barrows, his wife Billy Barrows, and Beverly Shea, the gospel singer, to cooperate with Christ for Greater Los Angeles in a great revival campaign. At the corner of Washington and Hill Streets in the city of Los Angeles, the largest tent ever erected for a revival meeting is now complete and is called the Canvas Cathedral, and the tent is filled to capacity day after day as men and women flock to hear the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There are 6,500 people seated here in this Canvas Cathedral, and several thousands more stand around the sides of the tent. Approximately 350,000 total attendance in two months. Because of the goodness and grace of God, I can say tonight I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth. Every moving of the Spirit of God has been accompanied with great singing, and so it has been in this campaign. A vast throng of earnest people gather here Sunday afternoons and every evening to hear the beautiful gospel music, inspiring testimonies, and to hear the Word of God preached in the power of the Spirit by Dr. Billy Graham to the salvation of thousands. I do not believe that any man, that any man can solve the problems of life without Jesus Christ. There are tremendous marital problems. There are physical problems. There are financial problems. There are problems of sin and habit that cannot be solved outside the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Have you trusted Christ Jesus as Savior? Tonight, I'm glad to tell you as we close that the Lord Jesus Christ can be received 